Welcome to RWJ Barnabas Health's Health Talk Show. I am Dr. Douglas Ashinsky of RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group. Here in New Jersey, the last weeks of summer are already upon us and the new school year will begin soon. Healthier students are better learners. It's time to make sure your children are ready for a healthy return to the classroom. On today's show, we will learn back to school health tips for your children, some risks that they may face, and the importance of preventative care. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Karen Ebel and pediatric nurse practitioner Tracy Augustino from Somerset Pediatric Group. Welcome to the show. Thank you both for being here and welcome to the show. First, uh, I'd like the studio audience to know a little bit about yourselves. We'll start with uh, Dr. Karen Ebel. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what got you into pediatrics. Sure. Um, I am North Jersey born and raised. Took some detours to Philadelphia for college, Mount Sinai for med school, California for my pediatric residency. Um, and I've been with Somerset Pediatrics since completing my residency in 2004. Um, I am a proud mom of two teenage girls, and I've always loved kids, and I've always loved science and medicine, and pediatrics really allowed me to sort of bring those two loves together. Thank you. And uh, pediatric nurse practitioner Tracy, tell us a little bit about yourself also. Sure. So my name is Tracy Agostino. I'm a board-certified pediatric nurse practitioner. I had my training at Columbia University in New York, and I graduated in 2013. And I have been working in pediatric primary care for the last 10 years, uh, most of which has been at Somerset Pediatric Group. Um, in addition to seeing patients in the office, I'm also an adjunct professor uh, for the, the pediatric nurse practitioner program at Rutgers University. And I am also a mom of two, and one of which is going to be starting kindergarten this September. So this topic is especially meaningful to me. So tell us now, uh, think of the audience not knowing very much about uh, uh, pediatrics. When, is, when should a child be brought to a pediatrician? Sure. So um, most parents are, are pretty good with knowing when to bring their child in when they're sick. Um, but it's equally as important to bring children in when they are well. Um, and it is recommended that they, they have those routine well visits. So let's start. They're born in a hospital. They come home. Uh, when do you think is the first time they should see their pediatrician? Or probably they should have actually met their pediatrician before they uh, uh, were born so that the parents know who the pediatrician is. Yes. So typically um, they'll, they'll meet prior to having the baby. Um, and then often the pediatrician will come visit them in the hospital to see the baby right after they're born. Um, and then they have pretty frequent visits that first year. Um, you know, within usually two to five days after being discharged, and then every couple of weeks for the first month, um, and then every few months after that. And for children ages three and up, it's recommended that they see their pediatrician at least once per year. And that's for? For their routine um, physical. R routine annual wellness yep. exam, which will include height, weight. Yes. Include any possible vaccinations if needed. Yes, so there's a lot that's included in that visit. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to staying up to date with a routine checkup. Um, so when we're talking about our school-aged kids, um, they may need it if they're starting a new school or a sport or a camp. Um, they may actually need to be up to date with that yearly physical in order to register. Um, but really, it's recommended for all children, no matter what the circumstances, to check in with their pediatrician at least once a year. Um, and as you said, it's a great opportunity to make sure they're up to date with their routine and recommended immunizations. Um, we check in on growth and development to make sure they're growing appropriately for age. Um, it's a time to address any concerns that the, the patient or the parents may have um, about their health. Um, there's a lot of screening that will be done as well. So in addition for getting a head-to-toe exam on the child, um, they'll also, we'll also check in to make sure that things are going well emotionally, socially, developmentally. Um, so for younger children, this may include things like making sure they're meeting their milestones appropriately, their, you know, their motor skills, communication skills, are they you know, acting social with other kids. Um, for school-age kids, checking in on how they're doing in school. Are, they, you know, are their behaviors okay at home and at school? 
um, and for our adolescents, um, taking a look at mental health, um, you know, screening for any at-risk behaviors that, that may affect their health in the long run. Um, and then depending on the age, um, we'll also screen for certain things pretty much every year. We'll check the heart, check blood pressure, um, and then at certain ages, we'll also screen for other things such as high cholesterol, um, anemia, diabetes, um, and it's just a really great opportunity to talk to the pediatrician, address any concerns, and make sure that everything's going okay. Other things, of course, important are vision and hearing testing. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, <clears throat> we start vision screening even as young as two. Um, we have our ways of checking the vision, even when a child can't read letters or identify objects. And the purpose of that is to identify what's commonly known as a lazy eye, um, where one eye might be seeing um, things in a strong fashion, the other might be seeing things in a weaker fashion. Um, and if we can identify that early on, we can have the family follow up with an eye doctor and correct that uh, concern. Um, we also do hearing testing. In the state of New Jersey, every child is tested in the newborn period for a hearing test. Once the children pass that, we still want to follow up and make sure that there aren't any subtle losses of hearing that might have developed as a result of injury, illness, or just general fluid buildup. So that is part of the routine screening that we do. And again, a lot of uh, parents, especially the first uh, children uh, parents, they have a lot of questions. What are common questions that they ask you? So as you might imagine, um, the most common questions would be related in the newborn period to sleep and eating. And as interestingly, those questions persist as the kids get older. Those are fundamental to a parent's uh, family member's concern about their child. And part of our job is to make sure that the child is meeting milestones in terms of growth and development, as Tracy mentioned, and to counsel parents about appropriate sleep milestones essentially at the various ages because in, in pediatrics everything changes as the child grows. So the big thing that they're going to ask are things like uh, if they're sleeping through the night, the, again infants sleeping through the night, uh, later on if they're getting up early, things like that. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, it can range from when should I expect my child to sleep through the night and that varies for the child. Um, in terms of that individual child's growth. And that's why it's important to have that continued conversation with your healthcare provider, because as much as we'd like to say there's one answer, there really isn't one answer. We need to have that individualized approach to every child and every family that comes into the office. Which is why it's so important to be have a place like Somerset Pediatrics so that they do have a, a fundamental place where they can ask questions when needed, when necessary, exactly. just to understand what's going on. Exactly. Uh, we're going to be soon going to back to school. What are you, what's going to happen with uh, pedi you the pediatric practice come August, September? Um, well, we get certainly <laughs> very busy over the summer uh, leading up to the back to school time. Um, lots of kids are due for their checkups, for their wellness visit, as Tracy said. Um, it's also a time where parents might have questions about the upcoming school year based on what may have occurred in the previous years, in preschool, uh, the transition from one school to another school, preschool to kindergarten, um, elementary school to middle school. And your pediatric office is a resource for helping families, parents, and their children to anticipate what some of those changes may bring and how to support your child. And it's not only children, but also uh, adolescents also. Big uh, step going from primary school to middle school, and even bigger step going from middle school to high school. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're here for the families because part of our training is anticipating all those changes. The thing that's constant about childhood is change. Children, usually, we're usually told, need eight to ten hours of sleep. How the heck are we going to be able to do that? <laughs> so I love this question. Um, sleep is so, so important, and it's something that comes up in almost every visit, um, and it, it has so many effects on overall health, especially for children. 
So, you know, we know that sleep has these major effects on our health. Um, getting an adequate sleep helps kids do better in school. Um, it helps for their mental health. It decreases their risks of medical conditions. And, you know, it, it just has all these benefits. Um, and as you alluded to, it can be challenging to, to get those types of hours of sleep, um, especially for our older kids. We have busy schedules and, and there's a lot going on. Um, but ideally, we do want children to get at least those 8 to 10 hours of sleep. And for younger children, closer to 9 to 12 is even better. So some children have struggled with getting that amount of sleep for a long time. Um, we may see other kids towards the end of the summer that maybe have slept well, but are a little you know, off of their, their normal routine for the summer when there's a little less structure um, and just need to get back on track. So a few weeks before school starting is a great time to try to, to institute some ways to get better sleep. And we do have a lot of techniques that, that we share with our patients to, to help them with sleep. Um, so whether it's the, the first time getting a good sleep habits or just to get back on track. Um, one of the first things you want to look at is the wake up time. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of control over what time kids have to wake up for school. Um, and I know in our area, this, the school wake up times are very, very early. They, they start very early in the morning. So you know, if your child's been sleeping until noon over the summer, you know, maybe slowly trying to get them closer to that ideal wake up time for when school starts. Uh, maybe you know, it, moving it up about a half hour each day until they get close to where you want to be. Um, the other thing that's important is we want our circadian rhythm to match up with what is required of us in our schedule for school and work and activities. Um, so, you know, part of this is going to be getting outside every day, staying active, um, trying to see sunlight. We know our bodies respond to light when we're awake, darkness when we're sleeping, um, and really trying to, you know, to kind of get that routine going again. Um, a lot of older kids and adolescents may be used to napping, um, taking naps in the afternoon or, you know, or after school to kind of get them through. And we really want to try to get rid of that habit when possible. Um, it's not always easy. Uh, you know, I usually warn kids that you know, when you first push through that nap, you might be a little cranky, you might feel tired. Um, but ideally, you get through that and just go to bed earlier that night. Um, we know that sleep is the most beneficial to us when we get it in a large chunk at night. Um, and actually, between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. is when we get the most beneficial sleep. So it's important to try to get our kids sleeping then when we can. Um, Ideally, you know, electronics are minimized before bed. So about an hour before kids should be sleeping, you want to start to shut those things down. Um, it's good to have, you know, a nice bedtime routine that they can be aware of. And that can vary depending on, you know, the family dynamic or the child's age. Um, and it can be simple. You know, for a younger child, it may be taking their bath, getting on their pajamas, reading a book with a parent, and then going to sleep. Um, for an older child, they may want to, you know, read a chapter of a book by themselves or do a short, you know, stretching exercise or meditation. But just something that they can predict each night is going to be the same and helps their brain know that it's time to start shutting down and getting ready for sleep. Um, and then equally important is a good sleep environment. So the room should be dark. It should really be free of distractions. So electronics being the big distraction there. Um, ideally, the electronics aren't in the room at all. Um, so when you have younger kids, this is a great thing to institute. A lot of families will have like a charging station in the kitchen where everyone puts their phones and tablets. And then this way they don't have to worry about them being in the room. You can see them again in the morning. Um, I know for our adolescents that are already used to having their phones in the room, this may be a tough sell. Um, but you can try. Um, at the very least, the phones really should be off or put on sleep mode and away from the bed. Um, when they're left right on the nightstand there under the pillow, even if the child's not actively using their phone, if it's lighting up every single time they get an email or a like on Instagram, um, it's distracting for them and, and certainly can disrupt that, that good sleep. Um, the room should be quiet as well, so um, you know you don't you don't want the TV or music or anything like that playing. Some kids do well with white noise, so especially if you live in a larger you know household where um, they're maybe they're sharing a room with a sibling or they're sensitive to sound, they hear someone get up to go to the bathroom or the car driving down the street outside. Um, a white noise machine or a fan can help to drown some of that out. And similar for kids who may be a little more anxious or, or worry more, um, a lot of kids will describe at night they lay down to go to sleep and they just keep thinking. They can't turn their brain off. They're thinking about the day and what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and the white noise can help to kind of drown that out as well. So, you know, these techniques, they, you know, I know they, they sound simple, um, but they're very, and they're very doable, but it does take a little time to get in those new habits. Um, and starting early can be helpful so it's not such a shock when school starts. Um, but if your child is you know, struggling with sleep, if this has been a long-term issue, if you're trying some of these techniques and they're still not working, this is a great opportunity to bring up to your pediatrician. Um, you know, and we can certainly help you with any other guidance you may need or to look if there's anything else that may be going on.
again, an importance to have the good communication between the parent and the uh, provider who's taking care of the uh, uh, family. Absolutely. Next topic, eating. <sighs> kind of difficult, especially <laughs> summertime eating versus uh, school eating and picking, picky eating versus is it a sign of an eating disorder? Thoughts on this? Yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, so much of what we do in pediatrics is very, you know, varies by age in the sense that um, in a younger child, um, toddler, preschooler, rigid eating can be very common and almost developmentally appropriate. Um, if there are issues with texture, really super restricted eating, um, digestive concerns, that's certainly where we want a parent, a family to bring their attention to their healthcare provider. Once we get into early school age, we would like to see a child start to explore a little bit, maybe be a little bit adventurous or tolerant of trying new things. Um, many of our colleagues talk about something called no thank you bites that they recommend to parents where uh, a child may be suggested or convinced to try something, um, but they might not like it and we wanna respect their taste and their perception at that particular time. Um, but family meals and sharing food in a pleasant, non-stressful way really will allow a family to get a good sense of what their child's comfortable baseline eating pattern would be. Um, in addition to that, uh, as we get into the older ages, uh, if we start to see very rigid eating patterns develop, if we see secrecy about food, not wanting to eat with the family, um, that's when we start to worry about eating disorder or disordered eating, we sometimes will call it. Um, that should raise a parent's flag to say, I need to talk to my healthcare provider. Um, again, summer eating, as you said, can be more liberal than during the school year. And again, that's life. We want to enjoy food. We want children to know that there's treats and healthy food. But again, I think coming back to the family environment where that message can be conveyed in a positive, non-punitive way, you will create a very positive eating environment. And so do we really have, do we have to think about eating disorders in the young or when do you think we have to start thinking about that? So I think we make a distinction between eating disorders and disordered eating. I know that sounds splitting hairs, um, but eating disorders per se tend to occur in slightly older children, later elementary. Some of our more disordered eating patterns might come up in a younger child, yes, where we might have hyper rigid eating patterns and significant distress, emotional distress, when presented with new foods or unfamiliar foods or foods that are presented in a different way than is usual. Um, there is a phenomenon called restricted food intake where we do have some younger children who are hyper rigid, more than our typical expectation. And certainly if a parent has a concern about that, we wanna hear from them. Um, caregivers are saying, something's not right. We would like to hear from them. We do have resources, we have uh, recommendations for how we can support the family, how to maybe try to test the child's limits and see what they're comfortable with. But if we really see that there is significant distress, we have a lot of community resources that we can direct the family to. Okay. Uh, eating, we've talked about. We've talked about sleeping. Now let's talk about sports and playing. Again, summertime, that means they'll probably be outside, but what are risks that the parents need to be concerned about for the kids? And you know, what, what, what do they really need to be looking at? How much exercise should we be getting them? So I think we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, probably address, <laughs> both address it. Um, summertime, I think, you know, pedi pediatrician, healthcare practitioners, our first thought is sunscreen, hydration. <laughs> Um, we want to make sure that the kids are getting adequate time to cool off from playing in the sun. So that's something that a child may not have self-awareness about. So that's when the adults or the older caregivers for a child would 
need to step in and say, okay, it's time for a break. So heat is something we really, heat and hydration, really need to pay attention to. Um, if we're talking about organized sports, um, most organized sports programs will have the standardized safety protocols in place that the coaches and the sports organization should be recommending to the family. And in particular, um, as we've seen this year, and I think over the last many years, we really need to be careful about head protection and chest protection because our brains and our hearts, we need those to be safe. Um, so with contact sports, helmets are a must. Uh, with any kind of riding equipment, uh, bicycles, scooters, absolutely, helmets are a necessity. And for um, ball sports, many high intensity ball sports, um, baseball, football, soccer, goalies, we're really emphasizing chest protection. So that's really uh, things that parents should be aware of, but the organized institutions should be recommending those as well. So again, for the summer, it's the suntan, suntan lotion, the hat, the sunglasses, as much uh, fluids as possible, getting them out of the sun periodically, getting them into a swimming pool at times if necessary, <laughs> especially if it's a 90 degrees or above. Absolutely. Uh, and allowing them to be out with friends. It doesn't always have to be organized. They can be pickup games also. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. And yeah. So yeah, so in, in general, um, physical activity for kids is, is very, very important. Um, and it's recommended that kids get at least 60 minutes of physical activity per day. Um, and I usually talk to kids about for it to count as, you know, the physical activity where you get the benefits of the heart health, you know, in, improving your muscles and bones, um, helping with your mood, um, you know, decreasing risks of things like heart disease later down the road. Um, you really want that physical activity to um, make you feel your heart beating a little faster, you know, than when you're at rest, and you should get a little sweaty. Um, and, you know, when we think about kids staying active, I think our mind typically goes to sports first, and, and sports is an excellent way for, for kids to stay active. It's fun, it teaches them sportsmanship, um, but not all kids are into sports. So, you know, if you have a child who's not interested in team sports, or, you know, maybe there are some barriers, whether they be financial or um, your schedule, or just access to, you know, some of these more organized sports organizations, um, there are a ton of ways that you can keep your kid active at home. Um, having toys around that can promote physical activity, so things like balls or jump ropes can be helpful. Um, and you don't actually need any props to keep them active. You can, you know, make an obstacle course in the house, have a dance party in the living room, um, playing the floor is lava, you know, doing jumping jack contests or animal walks um, are all great ways to keep kids active. Um, for your, you know, older kids and adolescents, they may like joining a gym or doing home workouts. Um, there's no shortage of yoga videos or workout videos on things like YouTube and other streaming networks. Um, and then doing things as a family can help a lot too. So, you know, going for a family bike ride, taking the dog for a walk, um, going for a nature hike. Um, I think the key really is, you know, have, doing something that the child enjoys. If they're having fun and they enjoy it, they're going to be much more likely to continue doing it. And gets them out from computers and from Absolutely. cell phones. It gets them outside. <laughs> Absolutely. And then even organized sports, it, it's the whole team concept. Yeah. It's, and, and as the team concept, that's how you get friends, uh, possibly for life, by doing things like that. Yes. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics just came out with some data showing a direct correlation between outside play and mental wellness. So in particular, in this time uh, where we've just received the Surgeon General's report on the impact of media on children and adolescents, knowing that we have a very easy and accessible resource for us to help the children, and that is promoting outside time, outside play. Um, and again, as Tracy said, all the various ways that can look for children, adolescents, and even older teens. So we come back to September, October, and it's time back to go to back to school. When should a parent keep a child from going to school, and what should they do about it? Yes, good question. So um, when a parent's making a decision on whether or not their sick child should go to school, um, they really want to try to take into consideration their child's well-being. Um, if they think what the child has may be contagious to other students or teachers in the school, um, and because every case is unique, um, we always have to use a little common sense too. 
So, you know, if, if in general, um, if a child has had a fever within the last 24 hours, they should stay home. Um, or if they're not well enough to really participate in their regular school activities throughout the day, um, or again, if you feel that they may be contagious to, to the other students. Um, and, you know, we, we learned with COVID that some, some infectious diseases do have these more specific periods of time where you need to stay home. Um, and if you're not sure, again, a wonderful opportunity to call your pediatrician. Um, you know, we can always guide you through exactly how long you need to stay home um, with a particular illness, um, you know, and, and help guide you from there. Again, important is, is that you want to protect yourself and you want to protect other people also. Yes, yeah. and, and finding the balance, right? We want to keep our kids healthy and safe and, and protect our community. Um, we also want kids to be in school. So certainly, you know, if, if your child is has had a cold and wakes up still a little congested but is eating and drinking and slept well and is happy and acting themselves, then sending them to school is probably okay um, versus the, you know, the child who wakes up congested and doesn't want to eat and didn't sleep well and is not themselves, maybe more cranky or more tired um, or is coughing so much that it might be disruptive to the other students. You know, those are all reasons that you would you know, consider keeping them home for that day to rest. One in five children, uh, statistics say, suffer from either anxiety or depression. Are there something that we should be aware of? Yes. Um, so thank you for bringing this up. It's an, an important issue and something that we, you know, see very often. And you know, we touched upon some ways to perhaps bolster our children and and maybe uh, respond to some of the uh, risk factors. But what if we see a child and, and we're concerned? What are some of the things that parents should look for in a young child? Um, could be sleep disturbance. It could be change in their eating pattern. It could be dysfunctional voiding, changes in their stooling or urination pattern. Um, separation anxiety can be common in young children, but if it seems to persist beyond, you know, sort of the expected period of time, a parent should talk to us and say, "Hey, I, I'm concerned about this. Let's explore this a little bit." Um, in older children. Um, elementary school, going into adolescence, if we're seeing withdrawal from family and friend activities, if we're seeing a lack of desire of participation in things that were previously interesting to the child or adolescent. Uh, sometimes rigidity in behavior can be a sign. Uh, sometimes um, outbursts, more aggressive or angry behavior can be a clue that a child may be experiencing anxiety or depression. So what may seem like, no, they're just angry, that may be a clue. And so we would really like for a parent to reach out to us and talk to us about what they're seeing. Interesting, just little changes. And again, that's why it's so important to be a, a parent who watches the kids, observes the kids. That's why it's important to have the communication with their uh, uh, pediatrician or their primary care provider, have that open access uh, both ways. Yes, it's, it's another reason that those annual visits are important um, because we really create a relationship with, with the kids and as they go from infants to toddlers to school age to adolescents. So, um, you know, when parents are starting to have some of these concerns, it's, it's much easier to talk to someone that the child knows, that the child's comfortable with, and, um, you know, it, it helps for, for everyone to, to get them help. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for all of that education that the uh, audience has gotten. I think that you both really have told everyone a lot of the information. I hope sometime in the future we can get back and continue this conversation. Thank you for having Thank you. us. Thank you so much. That concludes today's episode of Health Talk. Please remember that the opinions expressed here today by our medical expert are not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. If you need a physician, please call 888-724-7123. For more information about RWJ Barnabas Health's Children's Health Services and parent resources, please visit us at www.rwjbh.org forward slash children's health.